Oddball Show features content intended for mature audiences. If you'd like to view a content warning before listening, please check out the episode description. The views put forth by our hosts and our guests reflect the speaker's opinions and not the official stance of Oddball Foundation. Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoy the show. Hey everyone, welcome to Oddball Show. My name is Irene Westfall and I am sitting in for Jason Wright today. Today we will be exploring another chapter in the history of psychiatry and mental health. The shock therapies and psychosurgeries that emerged in the early to mid 20th century as these allegedly groundbreaking new cures for mental illness. So we now know that many of these treatments alleged cures were an illusion. But it's still worth going back and seeing how these treatments worked, or were supposed to work, and what they reveal about how society dealt with mental illness and psychiatric patients in the early to mid-1900s. Also, which treatments, if any, are still used today? I'd like to give a quick shout out to Anne Harrington's wonderful book, Mind Fixers, which we used for a lot of the research for this episode. If you haven't checked out Mind Fixers, please go and do that. It's a fascinating, if somewhat disturbing, read. We will have a list of all of our resources in the show notes for anyone interested in learning more. So, let's start off with malaria fever treatment. Have you ever heard of that? I hadn't. Basically, is the idea that getting really, really sick and having a high fever might help you get better when you recover. So this treatment has its roots in the work of Austrian psychiatrist Julius Wagner Jorag. In 1887, Wagner Jorag noticed that a mentally ill patient of his, who'd come down with a very high fever, seemed to have improved remarkably afterwards, from the psychosis, that is. He wanted to test out whether the fever had actually improved his patient's mental state. And so, horrifyingly enough, he then injected several psychotic patients with an experimental tuberculosis vaccine. He wanted to see if the fever that the vaccine caused would cure them. It didn't, and some patients died. Then, Wagner Jurek thought that maybe this fever treatment could work on patients with something called general paralysis of the insane, or GPI, which is what we now know as the psychosis that's caused by late-stage, untreated syphilis. When it's untreated, this disease is always fatal. Syphilis was a huge problem in the early 20th century. Um, Al Capone died of syphilis, by the way. And it was something that troubled psychiatrists and doctors everywhere. Wagner Jurag wanted to test out this hypothesis that fever treatment could work on GPI. To test it out, he would use malaria. Malaria is a dangerous and sometimes fatal disease, but unlike that experimental vaccine, it could be reliably treated with the drug quinine. So, in 1917, Wagner Jurag withdrew blood from a soldier with malaria, and injected it into nine patients with GPI. These patients became quite sick, and Wagner Jurg let the fever run its course for weeks before then curing them with quinine. So, what happened? According to Wagner Jurg, anyway, six out of the nine patients improved. It's a whole two-thirds. So these results were promising enough to try out the malaria fever therapy, as it was called, with 200 patients. Eventually, from these experiments, Wagner Jurag reported a 25% success rate. So let's do the math. This might not seem like a lot to me or to you. If I got a 25% on a math test, for instance, I'd fail pretty miserably. But for GPI, it was a lot more than anyone else had managed before. It was actually considered so groundbreaking at the time that for his work in treating GPI, Wagner Jurag received the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 1927. But make no mistake, it was a dangerous treatment. The mortality rate could range from 3 up to 20%. Nevertheless, malaria fever treatment forged on. For decades, it was actually the global standard for treating GPI. But what does that mean, the global standard, when malaria is an endemic all over the world? Where did all of this malarial blood come from? Some hospitals, notably St. Elizabeth's in Washington, D.C., started using psychiatric patients who didn't have GPI to serve as, quote, malaria reservoirs. Now we get to arguably the most disturbing part of this whole chapter. So these malaria reservoir patients, who were often the most vulnerable and marginalized in the hospital, would be infected with malaria intentionally, their blood would be withdrawn for later use, and then they'd be cured with quinine. This would happen over and over. Who were these patients? 
Now, we don't know for certain whether people were made to be malaria reservoirs because of their race or gender, but as Anne Harrington has argued in Mind Fixers, it is notable that St. Elizabeth repeatedly used the blood of a man named Hussein, whose, quote, racially ambiguous status may have made him more vulnerable to abuse. We also don't know exactly how widespread this horrific practice was, but we know it was common in St. Elizabeth's, which was a pretty large and influential hospital in D.C., as well as in some hospitals in Austria. So, what happened to this treatment? Did it actually work? Well, it didn't die out because of ethical concerns. Instead, the development of penicillin during World War II basically made it obsolete. Penicillin quickly became the standard treatment for syphilis, treating not only those with late-stage GPI, but also people in the early stages of that disease. That meant overall that there were far fewer GPI cases around. And as for the efficacy of malaria fever treatment, we still don't totally understand how and whether it worked on GPI. Unlike most mental illnesses, GPI is caused by a sexually transmitted bacterial disease, syphilis, making it treatable with penicillin. However, it is possible that when patients did recover following the therapy, what was actually going on was that the malarial fever caused an immune response that then helped the body fight the syphilis too. Kind of fascinating stuff. So let's move on to insulin coma therapy. Insulin coma therapy was another treatment that used some intense physiological ordeal, in this case a coma rather than a fever, to treat psychosis. So the story starts in 1921, when scientists Frederick Banting and Charles Best discovered how to isolate and use insulin, which is a hormone used to help the body absorb and store blood sugar, to treat diabetes. This was a huge breakthrough. In the wake of that discovery, lots of other scientists hoped that insulin could be used to treat a ton of other diseases, not just diabetes. They wanted to try it on mental illness, too. So in high enough doses, insulin can induce comas. In Switzerland in the late 20s, clinicians began injecting psychotic patients with insulin to create hypoglycemic comas. This was meant to calm them down. Then, Manfred Zockel, a young Viennese doctor, took things a bit further. He injected a patient with psychosis with so much insulin that the patient experienced a seizure and then went into a deep coma. But then, when Sockel reversed the coma, which you do with an injection of glucose, the patient seemed to get so much better that he was able to actually leave the hospital and go back to work. Was that because of the insulin coma therapy? Was it more than just a way to calm patients down? Maybe it was actually curing the mental illness itself. Well, Sockel thought so. And he worked hard throughout the mid-1930s to test out and publish reports on his new treatment. An American psychiatrist noticed... After he observed Sockel perform insulin coma therapy, he helped arrange for Sockel to come to the States and promote the treatment. So as the popularity of insulin coma therapy grew in the U.S., so did the media coverage on it. And this media coverage was often somewhat outlandish and a bit overstated. Still, though, initial results seemed promising. A 1938 report on 1,000 insulin coma therapy treatments found that 11% of patients with schizophrenia recovered 26.5% improved a lot, and a whole other 26% improved somewhat. The remaining 36.5% apparently didn't do as well. So, ICT is spreading around the country, but what did it look like on the ground? Well, it was expensive, and it was hard to put into practice. It required a lot of money and intensive care to ensure that patients remain stable. I mean, remember, we're putting a lot of people into comas, that need to be observed and watched to make sure that they don't die. Even in huge hospitals, only 20 or 30 patients could receive insulin coma therapy at a time. And it was dangerous, too. The mortality rate varied from 1 to 10 percent. Patients weren't given anesthesia, and there was always a risk of something called a prolonged coma. This is when the glucose that was meant to wake patients up didn't work. But the ICT wards themselves were, for many patients, actually special and genuinely therapeutic. Patients got specialized attention from nurses and staff that involved not only watching their comas, but also games and other fun activities. One doctor, British psychiatrist Harold Bourne, reflected decades later that maybe it was that feeling of finally being cared for, not the coma itself, that made ICT effective for some patients. So, what happened to ICT? Eventually, 
it was more or less replaced by a thing called metrazole shock treatment, which was a much cheaper and quicker way to induce convulsions and coma in patients with psychosis. So, let's move on to metrazole shock treatment. So, what is metrazole shock treatment? In the 20s and 30s, Hungarian psychiatrist Ladislav Maduna theorized that schizophrenia and epilepsy were antagonistic diseases. This means that having one of these conditions would prevent or inhibit the expression of the other condition. Some research studies tried injecting epileptic patients with schizophrenic patients' blood to see if their epilepsy would get better. Nothing happened. Also, schizophrenic blood. Jesus Christ. Maduna thought that it could work the other way. That is, that seizures could have a positive effect on patients with schizophrenia. He had noticed that some of his schizophrenic patients who also had epilepsy seemed to get better after their seizures. So he tried several different substances that cause convulsions, and then eventually he settled on two. These were called metrazole and cardiazole, but they're both derived from the same chemical. When you inject these drugs into patients' bodies, they cause immediate convulsions. In 1937, Maduna published a report called Convulsion Therapy for Schizophrenia. In that report, he describes amazing results of the treatment on 110 people. Half, he claimed, fully half, recovered, and many others with schizophrenia at least improved. So the treatment spread widely in the 30s and early 40s. Hospital staff noted that it helped to calm patients, and it also allowed them to use fewer sedatives. But patients hated the treatment. The convulsions were so intense that they could lead to broken bones, lost teeth, even spinal fractures. At the New York State Psychiatric Institute, for example, a full 43% of patients undergoing this treatment had spinal fractures from it. So this was unsustainable, and metrosol shock therapy didn't last. But the idea did, and soon emerged electroconvulsive therapy. So let's move on to electroconvulsive therapy, or ECT. This was the shock therapy that in turn began to replace metrazole shock therapy in the 40s. And notably, this is the only one of these treatments still in use, though it's done differently now than it was back then. So ECT is essentially inducing a seizure with the use of an electrical current in order to alter the chemistry of the brain. So let's go back to the 1930s to understand its origins. In the 30s, clinicians and scientists were looking for alternatives to metrazole shock treatment because it could be so harmful. Ugo Sarletti, an Italian neurologist, experimented with using a controlled electrical current to induce convulsions. This will sound pretty grim, but Sarletti was modeling his experiments on the type of electric shocks given to pigs to stun them before being slaughtered. Sarletti's assistant, Lucio Bini, tweaked and tested a prototype on stray dogs and he managed to refine the way the current was administered to the animal. By 1938, these two men felt that it was safe enough to test out on a human being. They found their test subject in a man nicknamed S.E. in later reports of this experiment. S.E. was brought to the hospital by the police in what appeared to be a psychotic state. He was speaking unintelligibly, and he believed that he was getting messages telepathically. Before moving forward with using SE as their test subject, Sir Letty and his colleagues checked to make sure that no one would be asking after him. He had no friends or family to speak of, basically in the wrong place at the wrong time. So now that they had their candidate, the doctors went forward with the experiment. They administered a series of shocks, each one stronger than before. It's a pretty dramatic story. In the middle of the process, SE allegedly sat up and then started singing a dirty song off key. Sir Letty then ordered that they administer the last shock treatment, which would be longer and stronger than before. S.E. then allegedly said, quote, Be careful. The first one was a nuisance. The second one was deadly. They proceeded anyway. S.E.'s spooky proclamation didn't come true, but the third shock did cause him to convulse and then stop breathing for 48 seconds. That must have been really tense 48 seconds. But then after he woke up, he seemed lucid. And a few weeks later, after undergoing voluntary treatment in the hospital, he was actually released. We don't really know what happened to him after that. As more tests were done establishing that ECT could be done both cheaply and relatively safely, the treatment spread widely in Europe and then in the US. So what were its actual effects? Well, a lot of how ECT works on the brain is still unknown. We do know that on one hand, the treatment can cause both short and long-term memory loss. 
On the other hand, we also know that ECT is genuinely effective for some people, especially as a treatment for major depression. ECT is sometimes used for mania and psychosis too. The way the treatment works today is patients undergo several treatments of ECT over the course of weeks or months. What's actually going on inside the brain? It's not fully understood how and why ECT acts on the brain to relieve some forms of mental distress. Studies have shown that the seizures from the electrical current might alter the brain's physiology and chemistry in many ways, including helping facilitate more communication between neurons. And so that's how it's done today. But it used to be much more dangerous and painful than it is now, and ECT was also criticized for being used to manage or control, quote, difficult patients. Who got ECT could reveal a lot about what was considered, quote, problem behavior. For example, queer people were sometimes subjected to ECT as a, quote, treatment for homosexuality. It obviously didn't make them straight, but it could definitely be traumatizing and deeply harmful. But it took a long time for the tide to turn against ECT in public opinion. If you recall from our previous episode about the Insane Liberation Front, it was in the 60s and 70s that we saw a rising tide of anti-psychiatry activism and popular sentiment. ECT had been around for decades, but it was in those years that ECT became synonymous with psychiatric abuse. Ken Kesey's popular novel One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest and then its film adaptation in 1975 were a huge influence here. What happens in that story is that our hero, McMurphy, is subjected to ECT against his will by the tyrannical nurse Ratched, and it's clearly meant as a way to control him, not help him in any way. And, spoiler alert, it does not go well for him. So let's move on to arguably the most infamous treatment on this list, lobotomies. Lobotomies were invented around the same time as ECT, created in Europe in the 30s and spreading from Europe to the US in the 30s and 40s. So let's break it down. What is a lobotomy? A lobotomy is a surgical procedure that severs nerve pathways in the frontal lobe of the brain. This is the region responsible for memory, emotions, and other cognitive functions like problem solving. A lobotomies have also been called lusotomies or psychosurgeries. Is it still around? Yes and no. Today there is a procedure called a cingulotomy, which was introduced in 1948 as a less destructive alternative to the lobotomy. Cingulotomies make lesions in a certain region of the brain, and they're actually now a relatively common treatment for conditions like OCD and chronic pain. But they don't have the same destructive effects on someone's personality and functioning like lobotomies did. So where did lobotomies come from? The procedure was developed by a man named Agaz Moniz, who was a Portuguese neurologist in the 1930s. They were actually controversial from the beginning, they were seen as the kind of intervention used when nothing else worked for treating patients' debilitating anxiety or obsessions. It was actually not intended to treat people with psychosis initially. So as Anne Harrington writes in Mind Fixers, we know that the lobotomy was controversial early on because of this Baltimore Medical Conference in 1936. So these two men named Walter Freeman and James Watts brought the lobotomy to this conference. They spoke about their experiments and horrified many of the attendees listening to this talk. These attendees, other psychiatrists and doctors, were horrified at how destructive this procedure seemed. But Adolf Meyer, who was a prominent and influential psychiatrist also involved in the eugenics movement, he spoke out in favor of the experiments. Eugenics, by the way, is the unscientific theory that humanity can be, quote, improved by encouraging some people, those with allegedly superior genes, to reproduce, and also by preventing other supposedly inferior people from doing so. Historically, the targets of eugenics policies have been folks with mental disorders, people from racial and ethnic minorities, and queer people. So, back to Adolf Meyer. He basically urged any scientist or doctor pursuing this new treatment, the lobotomy, to be responsible and conscientious. Meyer said that lobotomies were worth exploring, just as long as scientists took care to make sure that the public and the media wouldn't be misled. So it was actually Meyer's support in these early days that helped make it possible for Watts and Freeman's work to continue. And as they published more studies, lobotomies began to take off as a way to deal with the most debilitating and troublesome cases in mental hospitals. But contrary to Meyer's hopes, the media did end up misrepresenting the lobotomy. News articles described the procedure as a miracle cure for insanity, anxiety, and fear. Just the fact that the media coverage of these treatments tended to be so over the top and, as we now know, pretty unsubstantiated, pretty interesting. 
I find the fact that the media coverage of these treatments tended to be so over the top and also, as we now know, pretty unsubstantiated, quite interesting. I think it speaks to the way that mental illnesses like depression and schizophrenia were seen at the time. These conditions were thought to be heritable and incurable, and they carried a ton of stigma. And suddenly, these treatments like lobotomies seem to offer hope, however misplaced that hope was. Hope and also control, and a way to push, quote, troublesome people out of sight. Today, of course, we know just how devastating lobotomies can be for a person's autonomy, personality, and overall well-being. One tragic example of this was Rosemary Kennedy, JFK's sister, who had developmental and intellectual disabilities. As she grew up, her family put a great deal of effort into teaching her how to behave properly in the elite world that the Kennedys inhabited. But when she began to rebel against her family's strict rules as a young woman, her family worried that she'd cause a scandal. In 1941, her father, Joseph, decided to lobotomize her while his wife, Rose, was away. Walter Freeman himself performed the procedure at George Washington University in 1941. But the operation was debilitating. Rosemary was unable to walk or talk for many months. Her many years of education were lost. Her family then secretly institutionalized her in Wisconsin, where she spent the rest of her life. Her story, which is now widely known, is probably not too dissimilar from many more stories that are lost to history. It's worth pointing out that, although men made up a slight majority of mental hospital patients in the 50s, 60% of lobotomies were performed on women. This statistic, and Rosemary Kennedy's story in general, speaks to the sexist and racist attitudes running through the history of lobotomies. Women and Black Americans were disproportionately targets for lobotomies. Let's take a look at Freeman's attitudes in particular about these groups. Freeman believed that Black people, especially Black women, were good candidates for lobotomies, in part because he thought that Black families were more likely to provide good post-operative care. He was also impressed with the operation's ability to turn, quote, very dangerous Black patients into docile patients. Women, meanwhile, as I mentioned, made up 60% of lobotomy patients, even though during that time period of the 40s and 50s, men made up a slight majority of hospital patients overall. So why were more women getting lobotomies? It was partly because of the patriarchal division of labor. Psychiatrists thought that women's typical duties in the home could be more easily done following a lobotomy, compared to men's duties as wage earners. Also, women's behavior was policed differently than men's. To be manic or psychotic or depressed or rebellious might have been less tolerated for a woman than for a man acting the same way. Freeman shared these attitudes with a lot of the psychiatric establishment at the time. As I mentioned earlier, influential psychiatrists like Adolf Meyer were part of the eugenics movement that was all about trying to fine-tune the human race and eradicate, quote, undesirable behavior. In these years, lobotomies grew in popularity as their usefulness seemed to grow. In the 40s and 50s, VA hospitals began using lobotomies on traumatized soldiers returning home from war. And then in 1949, Agaz Muniz received the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine for his work in developing the procedure. Maybe he was seeking a Nobel Prize of his own when Freeman continued to innovate. He developed a new type of lobotomy called the transorbital lobotomy. Instead of surgically opening a person's skull, which was a difficult and expensive process, the transorbital lobotomy was performed with a pick inserted through the eye socket into the brain. It then severed linkages in the frontal lobe. It was so fast and easily done, Freeman argued that non-surgeon psychiatrists could safely perform the procedure. But James Watts, his colleague, strongly disagreed. He thought the lobotomy was a serious surgery that shouldn't be done by just anyone. He also thought it shouldn't be done on just anyone. He and Freeman butted heads over which cases warranted a lobotomy. Watts thought they should be used only on the most serious cases. That was people who didn't respond to other forms of treatment and who had symptoms like debilitating anxiety. Increasingly, though, Freeman thought that they should be used early on in the course of a mental illness. He thought they'd be more effective that way. He also thought they should be used on a much wider group of patients. Remember, lobotomies weren't initially intended for schizophrenia. Even Freeman didn't think that lobotomies would actually cure people of psychosis. Instead, what he thought was that the procedure would make these people less upset by their delusions and calm them down. If that came at the price of patients' creativity, then so be it. At least, according to him, they might be able to go home and become laborers. 
To quote the man himself, even if a patient is no longer able to paint pictures, write poetry, or compose music, he is, on the other hand, no longer ashamed to fetch and carry, to wait on tables or make beds or empty cans, end quote. That's how Freeman saw the work that he was doing. So having broken by Watts at this point, Freeman went on a cross-country tour in the early 50s called Operation Ice Pick. The goal was to spread the use of lobotomies as widely as possible. Freeman performed procedures in hospitals around the country, sometimes hundreds in a single day. One ex-patient we spoke to recently described Freeman as a sort of Johnny Appleseed of lobotomies, and it's easy to see why. So what happened to lobotomies? The approval of chlorpromazine, which is also known as Thorazine, in 1954 by the FDA, eventually led to the downfall of this procedure. Thorazine was actually called a chemical lobotomy because the effects, which were sedation, docility, and apathy, were similar, but also less harmful than a surgical lobotomy. And like ECT, it wasn't until the 70s that lobotomies really came under fire for the harm that they'd done to thousands of people. Conveniently, though, by that point, clinicians began to say that they'd always oppose the procedure. But for many folks, the damage had already been done. So let's recap. In this episode, we've chronicled five psychiatric treatments. The perplexing thing about some of them is that, in some cases, they seem to actually work for some people, or at least clinicians claim that they did. But crucially, at what cost? Malaria fever treatment maybe did succeed in jolting a patient's immune system to action against malaria and syphilis, which was causing the psychosis. But it was dangerous and miserable. And the way that hospitals chose to do it was by purposely infecting and reinfecting the hospitals most marginalized with malaria. Insulin coma therapy carried a high mortality rate among patients and serious side effects, though that 1938 report did claim that a full 63.5% of patients improved or were cured of schizophrenia. Somewhat dubious. Later studies questioned the efficacy of an insulin-induced coma over other kinds of comas or drugs. And it's also really hard to say whether the benefits that people did enjoy were due, at least somewhat, to just getting more attention and care. Metrazole shock therapy, whatever its supposed benefits, carried a huge risk of spinal fracture and other broken bones. Of all of these treatments, only ECT is still used, though more often for depression than schizophrenia. Though it carries the risk of memory loss, it can also help lift people out of the worst periods of their lives. And finally, lobotomies risk sacrificing a patient's individuality in exchange for being easier to manage for the people and institutions around them. And, as we've discussed, sexist and racist attitudes about whose behavior needed the most regulation also factored in deeply. Any medical treatment has trade-offs. The kinds of trade-offs people are willing to accept, especially when they're making decisions on behalf of others, are deeply revealing of what we value and what we don't. For many doctors in the mid-20th century, for example, the costs of lobotomies, stuff like loss of creativity, autonomy, and personality, were worth the benefits. The benefits were measured by how well a troublesome patient could work and cause minimal disruption. For researchers pursuing a treatment for GPI, the possibility of scientific breakthrough and individual renown were worth sacrificing the health of patients made to serve as malaria reservoirs for their syphilitic peers. And in the 21st century, to take a more optimistic example, some people suffering from depression might reasonably decide that the risks of memory loss are worth it or with the possibility that ECT might release some of their symptoms. But back to what we value and what we fear. We fear psychosis, we value productivity. We fear the unknown, and we value scientific innovation, even at great cost to people's lives, if it means chipping away at the mysteries of the brain. I don't mean to suggest that scientific innovation, productivity, or simply the reduction of distressing symptoms are unworthy goals. But it's worth thinking about who in these medical histories got to decide what's worth it in the name of recovery or progress, and who should get to decide today. I think we should also consider what the trade-offs are, more broadly speaking, when we invest our resources and our hope into specific medical treatments to fight mental illness, and not, for instance, into changing the circumstances that tend to exacerbate or cause mental distress for so many. These are things like economic instability, homelessness, violence, and a pervasive sense that the people in charge are not looking out for our best interests. These pursuits aren't mutually exclusive, of course. But the histories explored here suggest that putting all of our hope into miracle medical cures may lead us to think that the causes and solutions to mental health lie on an individual level. <laughs>
So who should get to decide the big questions in mental health care? Can we advocate for mental health care on an individual and societal level? These are tough questions, and if you have answers or just thoughts, I'd like to hear from you. So don't be a stranger. Feel free to reach out to team at oddballfoundation.org or leave a comment and tell us what you think. This has been Oddball Show's Mental Health in Minutes. Thanks for listening. If you liked what you heard in this episode, learned something new, and want to stay up to date on what's going on with Oddball Show, please consider liking this episode and leaving a review. Subscribe to Oddball Show on YouTube, Buzzsprout, or wherever you get your podcasts. And check out oddballmagazine.org for more fascinating stories, poetry, and art. Thanks for listening.